J.R. Hayes, Convict's Thoughts. Welcome back. This is part two of three. If you've missed it, part one. Shock, lies, and arrest. Go find that video before watching this. This is part two of that series out of three. So, I was spoken up to the point of where this young man, Brian Koberger, was arrested out of the blue in Pennsylvania. But, a lot of things led up to that, to where people had many different mindsets of who could possibly be involved. and So, it became a shock for everybody when this out-of-the-blue arrest happened. And then, moving forward, things just quickly continued to add up to not only kind of the shock effect, but also into the lying effect. So we're going to continue forward after the arrest and just kind of walk step by step moving forward here, trying to make sense of everything that was happening. Now, as the young man walked in for his arraignment, I think most of us all knew what his charges were going to be times four with a burglary charge. Made sense to me. I had no issues with it. But visually watching the man walk into the courtroom, I, I realized this is a very intelligent young man. He's carrying himself pretty well. And if I ever had to analyze this person as if he had walked on a yard with me when I was doing my time, uh, he carried himself pretty well. He didn't seem really intimidated by the whole scene. But he, he was still compassionate to look at people and nod his head as if he accepted and acknowledged what they were saying to him. So in the back of my mind, I didn't see some crazy-minded this Looney Tune had lost it all and gone off the deep end and taken four lives and not understood what was going on. He seemed very understanding of his entire surroundings. So I... I I took that as a pretty good uh, mindset of, well, this is going to be another Ted Bundy-like individual, or there's going to be a lot more to this story that's not going to make a lot of sense as we work our way through it. Either we don't have everybody that's involved in this, or this young man just personally isn't involved at all. Obviously, we made it through the initial arraignment, and then we had to make it into the plea hearing to where he was going to enter his plea. And at that point, my wife and I were discussing things back and forth. And, you know, she had brought up kind of some things that were funny to me of my past of when I stood silent uh, at my plea hearings for various reasons of... I was going to combat the charges. A couple of them, I didn't feel like the charges that they were charging me with even pertained to me at all. So I wasn't going to enter a plea. I was going to stand silent so I could actually dispute an upcoming, you know, either grand jury or a preliminary hearing indictment. My indictments most times, ladies and gentlemen, either happened prior to my arrest, and that's where they actually secured the arrest warrant, or two, they happened immediately after my arrest. Never was something set for me that was going to be months down the road when it came to a grand jury indictment. If I did have to wait a period of time, it was typically a preliminary hearing. And if the indictment went through on a preliminary hearing, I just always knew there wasn't really a basis to go in there and fight it. So... You would never dispute a preliminary hearing because your defense counsel is actually there and they are cross-examining witnesses and evidence. And if it's deemed that you're indicted at that point, they probably had the evidence to be able to do so. A grand jury is much different because it's held in silent, it's secretive. You don't know what they've presented to the actual jury. Typically, it's a pretty good amount of the evidence gets shown to them. The witnesses come up and tell their stories, and then the grand jury goes behind you know, closed doors and makes their determination on your indictment. It's not hard to secure a grand jury indictment. It's the easiest way to get one, and anybody that thinks any differently has not been through the process. 
A grand jury indictment is just about guaranteed. It's very rare that you don't get a grand jury indictment when one is presented in front of the secret jury. So, it really kind of surprised me at first after this young man entered nothing. He stood silent for his plea, so obviously the not guilty got put in by the court and the judge himself, herself at that time. But it, it shocked me that it was set for a prelim. And I scratched my head. I said, a prelim? Why would they even go that route in a case of this nature? If they went all the way across the country to get this guy, they got to have substantial evidence that a grand jury would quickly just go ahead and indict him. So it told me through time, because it wasn't immediate that things start transpiring. They, they literally set this prelim for a couple of months down the road. So there was time until this prelim was going to happen. And that told me in the back of my head, I, they might not have substantial amount of evidence. They might only have what's in that PCA that's a theory-based document. That might be all they have. Or they're still scrambling to gather said evidence. We knew they had a sheath with some DNA on it that was stated in the PCA. We knew they had the pings of the cars, uh, and they had an eyewitness. So, okay, they that that DNA sounded damning to so many, and I began questioning it from the very first moment. Conspiracy theorist I became, but I wasn't the only one, so I felt okay about that. As we were moving forward towards the prelim, we start seeing a few leaked information things come out in regards to, you know, the, the roommates that were alive, and Bethany Funk most likely has some information that needs to be presented, and the defense is trying to talk to her, but she's declining that, but... You know, an agreement's been made before the prelim that she would meet with the defense counsel and discuss things. Then with the video of the field where the officers were uh, getting information from the young men that were drinking underage. And you see the vehicles moving in the background. So immediately I, I grew interested in those vehicles and the timing of it. Because in the PCA, it says he's entering the area at 329, yet clearly watching that, the video was well prior to that. So are these not the vehicles, or are these vehicles? Why would you even release this information? Why did that body cam come out? I know the house is in the background. You can see the lights and stuff that they have shown many times go out in the house, but... What in the heck are these officers even doing? You know, it, it's crazy because the lining of the body cams that are coming out are showing officers talking noise complaints and this and that, you know, at the house. And you know, there's so many underage drinkers in that area, but yet they want to release body cam footage of this night, of the night of the actual crime happening, of underage drinkers being harassed when. They were never harassed in any of the other body cam footages released of parties at the house. My whole point of what I'm getting at is so much stuff was coming out to build a mental visualization of this crime through the media rather than through said evidence. It was all coming from the media, and it was all bogus right off the bat. You could tell what it was, and they were playing to the emotional side of people out there to find this individual guilty, not based off of evidence, but based off of falsehood, you know, feeding of stuff through the, the mainstream media. And it, it was constant, constant. And watching it would make most people sick because you could tell where they were going with this, but so many people took it as the Holy Grail and were finding this gentleman guilty. 
working our way through the fact that now the IgG information starts to come to the surface. We start seeing the motions to compel evidence filed by the defense into the courts one after the other, meaning the discovery is not being turned over appropriately. What's going on here? I'm scratching my head too because in the cases where I, I knew I was in trouble and I was caught red-handed, I still had the debate in my mind of fighting it. Even in the times I did stand silent, you know, you have to make that decision on whether you're going to carry this out and take it to trial. Because if you take it to trial and lose, even on lower level felonies, they give you the max. They punish you for the costs of taking it to trial by giving you the max sentence allotable to you. And even sometimes they'll find ways to add more time to that or take away your good time. Or like the Parkland shooter case, he took that to trial and they even took away his commentary, his right to commentary. Uh, not sure that's really up to the courts because the commentary comes down to what the penitentiary system deems you. That's their way of controlling you in there. It's, it's, if you get in trouble, they'll take away your commentary. So even in the Parkland, Parkland shooting suspects, it, you know, it's odd how it all works out, but, you know, there were, there's a lot of rumblings at that point when they switched to the grand jury indictment that now he's going to dispute that because there was said to have been errors within that. They weren't quickly speaking it, but lack of evidence was beginning to show itself very early on, even though the mainstream media is pushing the stocking and the, you know, the, the mental illness from his younger years and the theft of his cell phone called in by the family. I mean, there was so much push to find this guy as, you know, an incel and all that. I mean, it was craziness how they were pushing all this stuff through mainstream media. Instead of just focusing on the fact, show us some real proof. Show us the evidence. Give us the real goods that proves that this Ph.D., highly intelligent student, had even the time, the effort, the mentality to be able to go do this. And even outside that, proves something that shows us he was in the home. They were relying on he was in the area, and a knife sheath with very minimal touch DNA was found at the crime scene. And I'm sorry, guys. I, I've been around where stuff's been manipulated in the fact that stuff's been planted as evidence or evidence has mis been misconstrued as this and it's really that. So I had a lot of questions about the knife sheath right off the bat, too. How it would even get to where it was and how it was found in the in the actual condition it was just baffled me. The, the PCA made no sense to me, and there was nothing legitimate coming out to prove anything of the nature of the crime within the house, how it happened, who was the target, you know, what, what type of DNA evidence is found in the home. It was just pure craziness. So I knew right off the bat we're going for an emotional drive by the prosecution because... Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're still going, and, you know, the prelim never happened. The grand jury indictment, of course, got secured. That immediately got disputed, so we've been going through the process of that, and, of course, that didn't happen as of yet. Uh, there's still a huge dismissal that, that's up for hearing here just in a couple of days. 24 accusations against the prosecutors for misconduct. There's a lot going on here that has not come to the forefront, but nobody's actually resolved the fact that there's still not even substantial evidence that's been talked about that shows this guy in the home, other than said knife sheath, which he immediately disputed. People have thrown up their hands. Why isn't he firing for his innocence? He disputed everything, including said knife sheath. He's disputed it all. If half of us in a room, if there were ten of us in a room, 
and you began discussing a case, and five of us couldn't understand how you got to the conclusion that you did, and you couldn't present us more information or more evidence where the five of us would be more understanding of why we were there, that's a split room. That means you can't find that person guilty. If this goes to trial in the status that it is, look at how many people have not found this gentleman guilty because it's not understandable as to why he's even under arrest in the first place. Doesn't make sense. But here we sit. Bethany Funk has never made a statement because she got out of that by avoiding the preliminary hearing and the meeting with the defense. Then other names have been coming up, like Emma and Demetrius getting out of the charges they got. In March of 2023, the largest Idaho drug bust in its history goes down. Uh, you, you see the drug connections with the families of the victims, and one of them is still having legal issues with a current warrant out for her arrest. So the whole plot just thickens and gets even crazier, and the people that have found this guy guilty based off the mainstream media drive of false information. I mean, it's false information. They didn't find the victim's IDs in his car or his parents' home. All this stuff that's come out as, I mean, there's even been rumblings of it wasn't a fingerprint or a, touch DNA on the snap sheet now it was blood and then that quickly had to be retracted it's because they're getting so constantly used to putting out non-factual evidence rather than let's just get to the facts let's get to the facts but how can we get to the facts if the prosecution won't even release the discovery to the defense we're in the ninth motion to compel evidence it's still not being compelled and for many of the instances the prosecution just stands up and says either a we don't have it or b it, uh, it doesn't exist and I, i'm going to make just an opinionated declaration here the fbi yes helped in the initial investigation people have continue to grind that into me that the FBI never makes mistakes but I'm going to tell you this of my personal feelings the FBI helped gave information to the prosecution said this is what we've got don't use this to bring charges against said individual until you have more we're going to give you the initial footing. Now you go find more. Well, when that didn't happen, I truly believe the FBI backtracked up out of this case, put their hands up and said, it's on you guys. Good luck. That's why a lot of the evidence is being deemed as, well, they never existed. They never had it. Well, we know the IGG family tree existed. They made that family tree. And then quickly got rid of it. I would think that would be knowledgeably known. That has to be used in the court of law to prove the steps that were taken to get evidence. you got to prove how you got to this suspect. So much swirling around, ladies and gentlemen. And it, it puts me into a state when people ask me, well, what do you think about... You know, what he did, standing silent. I think he did the absolute right thing. What do you think about the alibi that was given when he was pressed to give said alibi? I think that's exactly probably what I would have done as well. I was going to keep the door open because, ladies and gentlemen, they stated he was keeping that door open because they wanted to get evidence of an alibi from testimony of witnesses. So if I don't give some sort of alibi, I can't even press that issue in the courtroom. So I give the weakest, just bare minimum, alibi possible, and it, it works. That's all he needed to do. Everybody can combat and say it's the worst alibi of all time. Great, it's not a good one, but it 
satisfied what was necessary to be able to still prove in a court of law during trial through witnesses what an alibi may be. Hint, Bethany Funk. You could tell they want to talk to her. You could tell that she's maneuvering out of the limelight. I mean, at this point, do they really have any valid witnesses? I know they say they do, but do they? Because we don't hear rumblings of anybody that's got more information other than Steve Gonzalez coming out and making statements for himself and for his family in protection of his daughter. Some of these things may very well be true, which would show many of us they probably don't think this man is either A, the only one, or B, the one at all. But we're pursuing through and we're waiting to see if we're going to be going to trial or not. A lot of people have asked me, what about the cowboys that came in with the cowboy hats in the dead of night? And, you know, grabbed some stuff out of the home. And I found it to be odd because we were already past them gathering such evidence. Considering they had let the U-Haul truck of said property of individuals of the house or to be driven away by an officer to be taken back to the family so if they were coming in that late of night and they really were searching for evidence that would have been because somebody gave up information that they needed to quickly go back in there and find something somebody said something that led them to believe there was something in the house they need to go grab and that would be you know, an informant or somebody of that nature that had a little more information. We know through all of this that the fraternity shut its doors and lawyered up immediately and has st stood absolutely silent in this entire endeavor. Not a word or peep, not a sound coming out from them. That's a pretty loyal group of individuals. So, you know, when I said my first initial thoughts were that fraternity was involved in some manner, some way. Uh, I mean, we were never going to find that out because they're loyal to each other. They're not going to talk and they're not going to put any emphasis on to their frat home. I mean, they're going to lawyer up and they're going to be quiet. And if the law enforcement can't get in there and break that and get into the said wording of people involved in that, they're never going to get information from it. So, great cover. Everybody now you know, is in a lost mode where Demetrius is no longer in the state, Bethany's moved on in life, Dylan's in hiding, and, you know, she's learning how to play games and do various things in life to help her mentally move forward. Emma, you know, her family's even put the home up for sale. She's disappeared completely. Her charges have all been dismissed, even her DUI, and she's gone to the wind and gone, gone, gone. You know, people have stepped up to the plate, they've spoken, we've had WSU Mom, and we've had uh, Anonymous Dave, and people that have given information. Some of it sounds like it could be very valid. Uh, nobody's pursued trying to find out more information on that. It's only been stated that they debunked it all, and I'm not sure you possibly can. The investigation into this crime is shaky, which leads me to believe at the end of the day there's some law enforcement uh, involvement in this. I think there's a lot of involvement from the actual university to put pressure on things to keep A, things very quiet, and B, moving along quickly so that we can, we can get this done and over with to make sure the, the college just announced it had the biggest numbers of attendance just recently so they're obviously moving forward and profiting and making money and that's all because this case is no longer uh, a hitch in the road uh, they've got the suspect in custody that they're going to pile drive into this case so to sum it all up because many have asked how do I feel all about this I think it's a bogus case I think they do not have the proper evidence to move forward in this case. I believe that the case was manipulated through mainstream media to grab P 
people's mindsets and get the majority of us out here to try and find him guilty without ever putting him into a courtroom. And I believe the falsehoods that continuously get spoken about his guilt, like him being a TA and losing his job, and there's so much garbage being thrown around. There's no chance, no chance that there, there's ever going to be remotely close to a fair trial in this hearing. It's either stacked so upon him it's a guaranteed guilty, or this is going to get dismissed if people come to their correct mindsets and realize this just isn't right. It's not right. There are multiple perps in this case. I don't care how you look at it. Even if they find this individual is the one that somehow committed this quadruple murder, there's other people involved, and they just haven't been brought to the forefront. They've either been given deals to keep them quiet and pointing at one person or something happened because it's not it's not normal that things like this stay so concealed where nobody in the area is talking nobody nobody's even come out and said they've seen this suspect in the area not not one college student has said yeah i've seen him on campus i saw him around the house you're telling me that this guy is stalking had never been seen. Nobody's ever talked to him. Nobody knows. Come on. Nobody's that good, ladies and gentlemen. Even when I was good enough to get off and away with my charges, somebody saw me there and we had to fight that. I don't know. I mean, the more that we dig into this, we can all put out our opinions. And I'm giving you mine. My opinion is he is not guilty, and there's going to be only two routes that we get to that. They either don't have enough evidence to prove him guilty, and he gets found not guilty at trial, or this dismissal with the 24 issues with the prosecution actually gets granted, and, and the court does its job. The justice system says, hey, if you want to prosecute somebody, do it the right way. Do it the right way. It's sad that many have lost the concept of what our justice system is about. It's innocent until proven guilty. You have to be able to prove people guilty. And I think one of the biggest misconstruments in life is the fact that our justice system works on an honest basis. It doesn't, ladies and gentlemen. If you look through cases over time, it's not even just cases I've been through. I could talk about my own experience. Look through time of how many people have been railroaded, found guilty, let out later, and the people that you absolutely know are guilty. I mean, it's evident they're guilty. Get off. Don't tell me the justice system is perfect, because it's not. It's not never will be and this case is a bright glowing star in the sky of how things could go very wrong but it's also a glaring star in the sky of how you fix that by utilizing mainstream media to create guilt ladies and gentlemen this is part two of three i'll have the final segment coming up soon my summation, I will go over what I actually think and who was involved in the Idaho 4 case. Coming soon.